how much iron can we absorb at once? And in a megadose of 200 milligrams, how much is wasted or left in the gut to cause problems? This is a clip from a live Q&A session open to CMJ Masterpass members. In addition to this episode, you can access lots of other free samples from these sessions at the first link in the description. The last runner-up is about iron. And I would summarize the question from Shauna Sturtz as, how much iron can we absorb at once? Now, her full question is, how much supplemental iron can the body absorb in one serving? Does too much iron ingested in a dose increase subsidin levels and therefore make it more difficult for the body to absorb the iron in the days to come? Does hepcidin naturally increase throughout the day? And if so, does supplementing iron in the evening essentially go to waste? There are protocols online for treating iron deficiency that recommend high-dose iron based on weight, but upwards of 200 milligrams a day spread throughout the day to combat iron deficiency with or without anemia. Is this wasteful and or dangerous? So the first thing I would say before we go to any of the studies is that typically iron intake has no relationship whatsoever to iron status because the body has a brilliant hormonal system to shut down iron when it doesn't need it and to increase iron when it does need it. And on a good diet, iron is exceedingly abundant relative to the needs for it which is why the genes for hemochromatosis, which are carried to some degree by 8% of the world's population, although the incidence of diagnosed hemochromatosis is much lower than that, that's why those genes tend to lead to iron overload because they disrupt the shutdown of iron absorption in the context of an iron-abundant diet. Now, an exception to this is the very high levels of iron deficiency anemia, where this general relationship that there is no relation between iron intake and iron status breaks down because people are consuming iron deficient diets. And I think that is largely cultural, um, you know, so especially the sort of um, post- uh, Sylvester Graham sort of American interest in beating themselves up over the amount of meat they used to consume and moving towards a more plant-based diet, which was really a niche thing until even more recently. Um, and now it's really gaining traction and will be imposed by governments. Um, and then, you know, if you go back into the sort of Neolithic agricultural revolution, you know, highly and highly hierarchical societies where the peasants ate just grain and the kings ate whatever they want and their nobles ate whatever they want. Um, this is exactly the world we are headed directly into um, if we all don't wake up and stop it at any cost. You know, so iron deficiency anemia will will go from something that has a significant percentage of women who experience it as a result of menstrual blood loss and relatively plant heavy diets in Western countries, and where large, huge populations of the world that are very poor, um, as a result of the intersection between agriculture and and geopolitics in the modern era where it's high there, it, it will become the norm as our society is plunged headfirst into plant-based for the peasants and private jets and meat for the rich and politically co connected. So expect this to become much more common. But anyway, um, generally speaking, because of the, re the regulation of hepcidin, it should not matter what you do with your iron intake. You should just eat, and that's the end of it. So keep that in mind in the background. Now, with that said, many people are iron deficient, so let's go to, a, to some studies that can open this up for us. 
And the first study I'm going to go to is from this camp that's that's promoting this alternate day stuff. So this is from 2020. Iron absorption from supplements is greater with alternate day than with consecutive day dosing in iron deficient anemic women by Stoffel and colleagues. And what they did in this study was they they gave people 100 milligrams of iron every day or 200 milligrams of iron every uh, every uh, every day or they gave these doses every other day. And if they gave them, uh, and we just stop there. And so what you're seeing is day two is the absorption of um, of these two supplements. 100 milligrams is in white, 200 milligrams is shaded. And it's the absorption of these. On the left is the fractional absorption, which means the percentage of the supplement that was absorbed. On the right is the total absorption, which is, on the left is what percent of the 100 or 200 was absorbed. On the right is is what is the total number of milligrams of iron that entered your body after you consumed the supplement. So day two is the first supplement. Day three is the day after. And day five is two days later. And so this is saying, do you get better fractional absorption if you wait two days to consume this versus if you do it the day after? And so what you can see is that the fractional absorption of 100 milligrams, and I, I, I want to, they're talking about primarily about the alternate day versus every day. I, I want to make a point about the, um, the dosing because it, it goes directly to whether this is all wasted or not. So the fractional absorption starts out at <laughs> the mean is this line, and it's, it's like probably 23%, something like that. 400 milligrams, but it's down around 15% for 200 milligrams. You can also see that, the, that the, um, this box represents uh, an ex like this box and these whiskers represent different degrees of variation around the, uh, this is probably the median here. And so what you can see is that there's a lot of variation in the 100 milligrams, but there's a lot less variation in the 200 milligrams. And the, the variation that is there is generally directed downward so that, so that um, you seem to be hitting an absorption cap with the 200 because uh, very consistently people are having lower fractional absorption with the 200 milligram dose then with the 100 milligram dose, uh, where you have a lot of variation. Now, if you go over to the total absorption, however, the total absorption is higher with the 200 milligram dose, right? Because what this is, say what this is basically saying is the first 100 milligrams, you got about 23% absorption from. So you, on average, you absorb 23 out of 100 milligrams. With the next 100 milligrams, you got a lot less than that because remember remember the, the, the different people who got 200 milligrams, they presumably absorbed 23 of the first 100 milligrams, but now they're absorbing way less of that than the, um, of the second 100 milligrams. And for their total dose, it's averaging out at around 15%. So the total absorption from the second 100 milligrams is probably somewhere around 10 milligrams. But 23 milligrams plus 10 milligrams is 33 milligrams. And actually, yeah, I think, I think I'm doing the math fairly similar. I can, this, if you extrapolate the total milligrams over here, it's somewhere around that. Like it's 30, you know, 30 to 30, somewhere between 30 and 35 milligrams. If you trace this line over, um, right. So let's just um, make these numbers are eyeballed, right? So keep that in mind. But 23 milligrams from the first 100 milligrams plus 10 milligrams from the second 100 milligrams equals 33 total milligrams instead of 23 total milligrams means you absorb more iron. So whether it went to waste or not all depends on is your goal to get more iron or is your goal to stop iron from sitting around in your gut? There are reasons to stop iron from sitting around in your gut, which are A, it can directly cause constipation and B, it can disturb the microbiome. 
But if your goal is deep curing a deep suffering from iron deficiency anemia, you don't have time to gradually increase your iron status. You will get there faster if you give 200 milligrams instead of 100 milligrams. So whether it's going to waste completely depends on what your goal is. Now, I personally, uh, you know, I, I would, I would say you would have to have debilitating symptoms to risk leaving, you know, 170 milligrams of iron in your gut to get 30 or 100, you know, let's, let's go with our math from before. If, if you, it, you should, I believe that you should have really debilitating suffering if you are going to say, ho-hum, 167 milligrams stays in my gut doing whatever it does there while I absorb 33, you know, but if you do have extremely debilitating suffering from iron deficiency anemia, and it is your goal to get relief of, as fast as possible, it may well be worth having 167 milligrams of iron sit in your gut to absorb 33 of them. Right now, I think the rest of this is kind of BS. I mean, it's real, but it's but it's nowhere near as relevant as this group wants to make it sound like it is. So what they're showing you is that you have, you know, this the fractional absorption tanks down on day three, and it it kind of it goes back up. Um, with the 100 milligrams, it goes all the way back up, maybe a little higher. With the 200 milligrams, it kind of partially recovers on day five. Why? Because you waited an extra day. Um, and, you know, mechanistically, why is this the case? Because this is serum hepcidin, which is the hormone that, that helps you regulate your iron storage. This is the hormone that makes it not matter what your iron intake is in the big picture, remember? As long as your iron intake is not below what your body is able to extract at max capacity and you don't have hemochromatosis, if those two extremes are not true, your iron intake has nothing to do with your iron status because of this hormone. Over the long term, over five days, that's not true because hepcidin jumps up in, in day three to suppress fractional absorption and then largely goes back down not totally, but it largely goes back down or it starts to go back down on day five, thereby giving you better absorption on day five. You know, the, 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 the thing that you're not seeing here is what happens if you just do this over and over again for two months, right? What, it, what should happen if your body works correctly is that it all becomes totally irrelevant. Now, if you, it's it's a, it's a little worse than that, right? So if you look at the total absorption, um, I well, okay, I don't. Let's so let's like you have a dip in total absorption, um, and you have a recovery of total absorption. Okay, let's 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 grant that for this study. But now let's take a look at another study that they did that was a little bit longer term. It wasn't long term. It was two weeks, um, but it was a little bit longer term. So this study is iron absorption from oral iron supplements given on consecutive versus alternate days as single morning doses versus twice daily split dosing in iron depleted women two open label randomized controlled trials by Stoffel in 2017 so this was actually done uh, a little bit earlier um so let me share my screen and i, I don't want to go through this whole paper but what they did was in study 1 what they did is they gave everyone uh basically the same model as before, but the alternate day they carried on for twice as long so that they could, that, that they could give the same total dosing of the iron. And then they switched people after, um, switched people at the end and, um, and then pooled the data. 
So this is consecutive dosing is in purple and alternative dosing is in green. And what you can see is that um, when they're doing statistics on it, the statistics they're able to show is that the alternate dosing has better... Uh, sorry, this is serum hepcidin. Sorry, let me go over here. So the, the alternate day dosing um, is, is better at the end of the study for fractional absorption percentage than, um, than the consecutive dosing, so every day. Okay, but... Um, let's look at, let's look at, at two things. Uh, well, actually let's look at one main thing. The main thing is that in order for the fractional absorption to be greater enough to make you absorb more total iron, it would have to be double, right? So if you are taking the iron every other day, in order for you to have better absorption leading to more iron absorbed, you're getting half the dose of the iron if you're taking the same dose every other day. So you would therefore have to have double the fractional absorption of the, of the every other day iron in order to get, um, in order to get better total absorption. That's, that's not even true. You would you would have to have double the fractional absorption to get the same amount of iron, and you'd have to have more than double in order to get more iron absorbed. So if you look at this, just trace this line over, you have maybe 15% fractional absorption for the consecutive, and you have traced it over to about 20%. You are way under double fractional absorption. No wonder they don't show the total absorption in this paper because they have obliterated the total absorption by increasing fractional absorption less than double while they half the dose per unit time. You know, now you can say, well, what if they had given two, they had doubled the dose every other day, or they had done this, this, that, and the other thing. The answer is that hepcidin doesn't just increase in, in response. Does, hepcidin does not primarily increase in response to the iron you just took. It increases in response to your total body, body iron status. So if if you if you double the dose on the alternate days, you'll make up for this not doubling the fractional absorption, but you will get more hepcidin in response to it, and your fractional absorption benefit will disappear, right? Because as long as as you don't have hemochromatosis and you do not have your total iron intake below the threshold of what your body can absorb at max capacity, what you do with your iron absolutely does not matter at all. And if you're supplementing one to 200 milligrams of iron, you take yourself out of the place where your total iron intake is below what you can get enough of at max capacity absorption and into the place where it's not below anymore. Now it's above what you need. And so now if you just repeat it over and over and over again, you'll get normal iron status no matter what. Okay. Now there's, there's an exception here, which is iron absorption inhibitors that I'm going to come to in a minute. But now I want to share one other study because you asked about this, the circadian rhythm. Just got to pull that study out. All right. So this is Trout 2012 circulating human hepcidin 25 concentrations display a diurnal rhythm increased with prolonged fasting and are reduced, reduced by growth hormone administration. <clears throat> so this is five healthy individuals sampled over 25 hours with standardized meals given at the arrows. And you see that hepcidin uh, basically maxes out around 3 p.m. and lasts and even increases a little bit at 9 p.m. Um, there's a pretty clear meal effect here, right? So it starts dipping and then they have another meal 
Uh, oh, actually, this is the following morning. Sorry, for the, it's the 2400 timing. Um, so it's, it's basically... Uh, So this is their this is their overnight fast here. So it's basically increasing from the time of the first meal and it's kind of maxing out around 3 p.m. They did this in um five healthy individuals after an overnight fast with fasting continued in, through the next day. And what you see is that the hepcidin increase is kind of there, but it's not as strong. Um so they go up till 3 p.m. But here they're going from a little below five to a little above ten, and uh, actually that is, uh, it's, it looks like they're having somewhat higher of a response when they eat. Um, now this is ten healthy participants with standardized meals, uh, with cholesterol administered with the first four meals. To um, I assume that's to burn iron absorption. I have to look more closely at the at the same study. And here you have more people, um, and they're kind of trying to mitigate the meal effect. And you see a and at least as pronounced rise. That's not it's not quite threefold, but it's in some people it might be due to the variation up here. But you know your two to threefold rise between morning and afternoon, continuing across uh, till around nine p.m. and then kind of. You know, even despite this last meal, um, so even despite these last two meals, I think where they didn't have cholesterol, I mean, although I don't think, I don't know how long it spends in the gut. Um, but, you know, my impression from this is that the meal effect is having um, a modest contribution to the diurnal effect, but the diurnal effect is real anyway. And you are basically going up from the morning till 3 p.m. and then hanging out there for a while. Um, so you could argue that uh, if you are trying to increase your iron absorption as fast as possible, that you should take iron in the morning. Um, if, if we just compare that to the first study we were looking at, and we look at the hep hepcidin increase, uh, here we have different units. We're going from about 0.25. If we went up to 0.75, that would be tripling it. So your hepcidin, you know, is go it's going less than it's less than tripling. Um, so two to threefold is basically what. If you take 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams of iron today, hepcidin tomorrow will be two to threefold higher. But your hepcidin is always two to threefold higher. In um, in the in the afternoon around 3 to 9 p.m. than it is in the morning. You know, but if you go back to that to that paper also uh and you go to the go to the day 3 fractional absorption you're still absorbing 15, uh 15% of the 100 milligrams and like 12% of the 200 milligrams. You know, so it's not obliterating the iron supplement, but again, I go back to the the fact that these short-term studies are interesting from a mechanistic perspective, but they're utterly meaningless from a long-term perspective because as your iron status goes up as a result of success, your iron absorption will go down in proportion to your success at increasing your iron status. So the only thing this can do is make you get better a little faster or a little, or a little slower. That's the only thing it can do. Now, with that said, the primary obstacle to your iron absorption is plant foods. So plant foods ranging from phytate to polyphenols to fiber to the amino acid composition of plant protein. Plants, it just, the most succinct way to state it is that plant foods inhibit iron absorption. All right. Therefore, if your iron is stubborn and it's not getting up, I would eat carnivore excluding egg whites because all animal proteins, including egg yolks, except egg whites, promote iron absorption. All plant proteins and egg whites inhibit iron absorption. 
pretty much everything else in a plant food except vitamin C inhibits iron absorption. Therefore, if you want to absorb your iron, you should take it with non-egg white animal protein and no plants. Um, so, and I think, you know, it's, you're not, not absorbing the iron at a high dose, but you are leaving a lot in the gut. So the way that I would optimize this is start with 18 milligrams. If you need to progress to 27 or 36, work your way up on an as needed basis. But your first goal should be eat a carnivore diet while you are restoring your iron status and then transfer back to your mixed diet. If that's impractical, eat a carnivore meal when you take your iron supplement and then eat your mixed diet in the rest of your meals. I think that is the best way to enhance iron absorption because you're, you will have hepcidin increasing long-term in response to your success, but you will not get around the fact that egg whites, plant proteins, and a whole host of things that are unavoidable in plant foods except to avoid plant foods decrease iron absorption. Like Those things are the things that are under your control. If you want to do it even faster, make breakfast your carnivore meal and take your iron at breakfast. Um, you know, this alternate, alternate day nonsense is nonsense because even in their two week study, they're getting, they're not publishing the total absorption because it will look bad because their fractional absorption didn't double. Um, so I, 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 I honestly think, I doubt these scientists are not seeing that. I, I think they just, um, you know, scientists have to publish or perish and they are highly motivated to publish novel ideas. And I think they found something cool and they're running with it. Um, but I don't think it's in the interest of their iron deficient subjects to go to push forward this alternate day nonsense. It's more complicated. It's harder to comply with. And basic logic and math tell you that it doesn't matter. Um, all right. So I hope that helps. This is a clip from a live Q&A session open to CMJ MasterPass members. In addition to this episode, you can access lots of other free samples from these sessions at the first link in the description. If you want to become a MasterPass member so that you can participate in the next live Q&A, or so that you can have access to the complete recording and transcript of each Q&A session, you can join at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass. You can save 10% off the subscription price for as long as you remain a member by signing up at chrismasterjohnphd.substack.com slash Q&A. That's Q&A spelled out as Q-A-N-D-A. These links are in the description.